Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm Janice Kaminer Resnick, and I welcome you on behalf of our leadership team, former Congressman Mel Levine, Zev Yaroslavsky, and myself. We welcome back to America at a Crossroads, Ambassador Dennis Ross and our wonderful moderator, Larry Mantle. Thank you both for being with us and for sharing your expertise and intelligence with our America at a Crossroads audience. Next Wednesday, we will present Marty Barron, the former editor of the Washington Post, who will be in conversation with Pat Morrison. This is a very timely topic. Axios reports that over the past two years, newspapers vanished at an average rate of more than two per week. Journalism is clearly at an inflection point. Marty Barron spent his entire career in journalism. Among other roles, he was an executive editor at the Boston Globe before he became the executive editor of the Washington Post. He experienced a great deal of drama at the Washington Post as shortly after he moved there, Jeff Bezos purchased the paper. Marty Barron has lots to share on the topic of the changing world of journalism in this particular decade, and we urge you to join us. Sticking on the theme of executive editors of newspapers, on Sunday, April 7th from Israel, we'll be hosting Aluf Ben, the executive editor of Israel's longest running newspaper, Haaretz. Ben will provide his perspective on the Gaza war and on the current political situation in Israel. It is also sure to be an enlightening hour. We'll hope you, we hope you will spend Sunday, April 7th, that's a week from this Sunday with us. Again, in advance of Good Friday, we wish our Christian audience members a joyful and blessed Holy Week and a very happy Easter. Now, please welcome my friend and colleague, a vital member of our leadership team, Zev Yaroslavsky, to introduce tonight's guests. Zev? Thank you, Janice, uh, and good evening, good morning, good afternoon to all of you, wherever you may be. Uh, as has been the case on the many times we've had uh, the privilege of having Dennis Ross as our guest, the timing of tonight's America at a Crossroads webinar couldn't be more propitious. Rising tensions between Bibi Netanyahu and our own government, seesawing negotiations over a ceasefire in the Gaza war tied to the release of Israeli hostages by Hamas, which looks increasingly like a mirage, growing political roiling within the Israeli body politic, and a war that is now six months long with seemingly no end in sight, having Dennis here tonight is profoundly timely. As most of our viewers know, Dennis Ross was an advisor to three United States presidents during the last three decades, some of the most consequential years in the Arab-Israeli conflict. He advised both Democrat and Republican presidents, and he continues to be a go-to maven for foreign policymakers in the United States, Europe, and the Middle East. He is the author of several seminal books on the Middle East peace process and related matters, and I highly recommend them for those interested in these subjects. He will be in conversation this evening with a regular on our programs, Larry Mantle. Larry is an award-winning broadcast journalist who has dominated intelligent conversation on public radio's LAist, formerly KPCC, for nearly four decades. He is a trusted journalist or as trusted journalist as there is in these parts and beyond. I consider him to be the Walter Cronkite of Southern California's broadcast journalists. What a team we have tonight. So Larry, I'm gonna turn it over to you, it's all yours. Zev, thank you so much, and I so appreciate your, your kind words. It's just an honor to be with, with you in America at a crossroads, Janice and Mel, for another program. And uh, Israel in crisis, these briefings are so important. If you've watched any of the previous programs, you know the remarkable guests that Janice and the team have brought in. Uh, last Sunday, we spoke with former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert. If you didn't have a chance to see that, like all of the America to Crossroads programs, it's available on their YouTube channel. Uh, so many great guests throughout the course of the Israel in Crisis series. So we appreciate very much this opportunity uh, to be able to talk with these outstanding guests. Uh, Ambassador, it's so good to have you with us again. Uh, before diving into our topic, uh, I think we'd all appreciate your thoughts on the passing of former Senator and Vice Presidential Candidate Joe Lieberman, someone I know you knew for many years. I did know him for many years, and he was uh, remarkable in so many respects. I think one of the most remarkable was he had this incredibly dry sense of humor. Uh, everybody knew everybody who knew Joe Lieberman knew that he was serious, that he was thoughtful, that on issues that of of serious matter, he understood them in an intricate way. 
and yet he had a style of that was often disarming uh, because there was this gentle, dry sense of humor. Um, I will remember that more than anything else, uh, in addition to the fact that he was someone that uh, really for several decades on these kinds of questions, I could always have a thoughtful discussion. Uh, and I always wanted to get his perspective. Uh, yeah. I might not always agree with it, but I but I always knew that it was rooted in something and it was thoughtful. And the truth is, I probably agreed with it more than I disagreed with it. We lost him yesterday at the age of 82, complications from a fall, uh, Joe Lieberman, the former U.S. Senator and vice presidential candidate. And I also want to remind our viewers, you can ask questions of Ambassador Ross. You can do that in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And please feel free to include your location along with your first name and your question. Um, Dennis, last week, the UN Security Council passed a resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. The US abstained after getting a concession on the wording for the time period of the ceasefire. In response, the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu canceled his delegation's visit to Washington. To what extent, in your view, was the US abstention a position shift on Israel's action in Gaza? I didn't really view it as a position shift in the sense that this was a, a resolution that called for a ceasefire for the remaining period of Ramadan. So this was not an open-ended ceasefire. Uh, it was tied to an unconditional release of the hostages. It was not a binding resolution. Uh, in terms of its content, it really didn't re represent a basic change. Uh, to be fair, of course, once the U.S. votes for a Security Council resolution, you could say a certain threshold has been crossed. But my impression is that the administration went to great lengths to make it clear, look, we're trying to affect the realities on the ground, not in an open-ended way, uh, and in a way that's designed to ease the circumstances. One of the concerns I've had all along from the very beginning when I when I began speaking about the war, I said one of the most important things for the Israelis to do is to draw a distinction between its need to defeat Hamas, dismantle the Hamas as a military organization, uh, make sure that it can't uh, reconstitute itself. But at the same time, in fighting Hamas, Israel has to draw a distinction between the Palestinians who live in Gaza and fighting Hamas. Uh, I said from the very beginning, and I wrote this, that Israel has to show this is about defeating Hamas and what it represents, not about punishing Palestinians. Now, to be fair, Israel has been faced with a very cruel choice. It's a really cruel dilemma because the way Hamas has embedded itself underground and, and used the Palestinian population in Gaza uh, effectively, not just as a shield, but as a, as a large body of hostages. Uh, and so the, the need to try to address the humanitarian situation has always been there. Israel has had to do a better job, I think, than it has. We can get into why it hasn't, because the Israeli public views the provision of humanitarian assistance when hostages are being held with no access, uh, and when frequently Hamas was diverting that assistance, there was a, an opposition to it. But the, the challenge of leadership is to take a position adopt a policy that reflects a strategic need. What you see with the administration is trying hard to improve the humanitarian situation, which is also not only required, I think, from a, a moral standpoint, but it's also yeah. required from a practical standpoint. And I'd, I'd like to get into the humanitarian conundrum a little bit later, because the stakes in that are obviously so high and the devastation and the human tragedy that we see there. I do want to go back to that UN resolution that yeah. the U.S. abstained from. Does that make any difference in terms of the likelihood that there will actually be a ceasefire? No. And the reason I say that is because uh, unless we have an agreement on how you bring this to an end, or unless you have an agreement on the hostages, there's not going to be even a partial, even a, a, a ceasefire uh, for a limited period. Understand that what's been negotiated is uh, right now is a 45-day ceasefire. Uh, 
and the release of 40 hostages. The issues that have been part of this negotiation relate to the number of Palestinian prisoners who will be released in return for that. Initially, Hamas was asking for 1,500 prisoners to be released. They wanted also to be able to select many of those, including those uh, who are have a lot of blood on their hands. They also wanted uh, the unconditional movement of Palestinians who are in the south to go back to the north. No limitations, no Israeli, uh, in a sense, vetting or control over those who would go back to the north. Uh, they were not requiring uh, a commitment to a full ceasefire. The, what they were saying is, okay, that'll be in the second phase. Uh, but they were, the issues were principally the numbers and the, uh, in a sense, the unfettered uh, a return of, of Palestinians to the north. The Israeli concern on the numbers was you're, you're getting 40 hostages uh, and you're being asked to release 1,500 prisoners for 40 hostages. Uh, the Israelis weren't prepared to agree to that number. The Hamas came down in the numbers from where they were. Uh, it was still not enough from the Israeli standpoint. The U.S. then made, Bill Burns made a compromise proposal, uh, which the Israelis accepted and Hamas turned down. Uh, so I, I think we're looking at a, at a negotiation that could create a 45-day pause if there is an agreement. We're looking at a negotiation that would make it much easier to correct the humanitarian situation on the ground. To be clear, the humanitarian situation on the ground is, is relatively, I would say, in the South, you don't see it nearly as desperate. In fact, ironically, the price of food in the Southern part of Gaza has actually begun to drop, which suggests that there's availability there. When you hear reports about famine, uh, hunger, that's in the north, uh, where there's about 300,000 people who are there. Uh, and part of the problem has been the pace at which uh, material goes in. Part of it has been the Hamas diverting it. Uh, part of it has been anybody who has a gun diverts it. So people who are in need are not necessarily the ones who are getting it. Uh, and there needs to be an answer to that. There needs to be an answer not only to the flow of humanitarian assistance, there needs to be a decision made about how you're going to secure the distribution of humanitarian assistance. I, I want to go back to the hostage negotiations because yes. you go to Israel frequently. So you you have a good sense of, of what public sentiment is and how it's evolved since October 7th. What is your sense of the range of Israeli views on how much the release of even 40 hostages should be first and foremost paramount over everything else versus the, the view in Israel that Hamas needs to be knocked out of power and that that is, is an even more important aim than the release of hostages. Look, there is a, there is a tension there, obviously, between these, these two objectives. For the hostage families, there is nothing else that should enter into it. Uh, and they make a powerful argument because the government absolutely failed on October 7th of their most fundamental responsibility was the protection of their citizens. And they shouldn't fail a second time. We know out of 136 uh, hostages who remain, we know the, the Israeli military has already informed 34 families that 34 of that 136 are no longer alive. The concern of the hostage families is you know, how many more uh, are not going to survive. Uh, and you can't say you won the war if in the end, none of the hostages survive. So that argument isn't just one that has, is compelling for the families. It's compelling for a lot of Israelis. Uh, there is a segment of Israelis who put the, the need to defeat Hamas above everything else. Most Israelis would say, Look, we need to be able to do both. And if it means that we make concessions to allow, uh, you know, to get our hostages back, you know, we can always revisit what we need to do later. But the first and for foremost priority is to get the hostages back. Well, I, I think I, there's I, a preoccupation in Israel with the hostages. I think it is, it is across the board. But there is a segment, especially on the right, and, you know, if you look at people like Smotrich and Ben Gavir, uh, at, at best, they pay lip service to the hostages they see, and they're the ones who are, 
absolutely against the release of Palestinian prisoners to get them back. I hear uh, some what seems to me kind of uh, conflating between defeating Hamas and eliminating Hamas, which seem to me to be two different things. And I, I wonder um, if if you can define those terms and and do you see them as distinct? I absolutely I absolutely see them as distinct. Look, I have I have written that you know, when Prime Minister Netanyahu says total victory, that's a slogan. It's not an objective. If you if you think that you can eliminate every single Hamas member and everyone who has a gun in Gaza, uh, Israel will be in Gaza forever. Uh, it will occupy Gaza forever, and it doesn't want to do that. It doesn't want to be responsible for 2.4 million Palestinians there. The critical question is, how do you define success, and and what is an objective that is a credible form of success? Establish an objective that is impossible to achieve, and you set yourself up for failure. If the aim is to defeat Hamas and to demonstrate that they lost, Israel needs to succeed, not establish a standard it can't meet. Now, the standard it can meet, and by the way, it is meeting, it is in the process of meeting, is the demilitarization of Gaza. Israel has already dismantled 19 of the 24 Hamas battalions. They have dismantled, Hamas is no longer a military. Hamas is now a militia again. Now, as an organized unit, as a, with command control, with weapons depots, uh, with a military industrial base, all that is being dismantled. That is the demilitarization. One of the things I have been trying to push for, I want the, I would like the Biden administration, present with Bibi, to come to an agreement, how much is enough as it relates to demilitarization? And then you agree also on what are the mechanisms that will need to be put in place on the ground to ensure there can be no remilitarization. The basic bargain of demilitarization for reconstruction is a fundamental bargain that can define the end of the day, a demilitarized Gaza where Hamas will not be in control because one of the ground rules has to be, there'll be no investment in reconstruction if Hamas is in control. And that is one of the ways you ensure that will not be. So create an objective that actually is achievable, that Israel is in the process of achieving, come to an understanding of how much is enough as it relates to that, agree on the kind of mechanisms that are gonna be required to ensure how you monitor all material coming in from the time it enters to where it's stored to its end use, who is gonna be responsible for security on the ground, especially as it begins with regard to distribution of humanitarian assistance. All these are, in fact, issues that can be, are, are, can be not just discussed, but can be an agreement can be reached on it. And then you're actually, then you are working towards something. One of the concerns I have right now is, it's not just that Israel is setting itself up not to succeed, is that you won't even know, how are they supposed to be able to declare success? Well, and the terms, well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the terms you're describing for what you would consider success would Bibi Netanyahu and his administration consider success? Well, he might, because first of all, one of the issues right now is what do you do uh, in Rafah, where there are four battalions? Of the five that are remaining out of the 24, four are in Rafah and one is in central Gaza. And he is saying, we can't end this as long as they have those four battalions. So if you're saying that demilitarization is the objective, and and basically because it sets you up to to ensure that Gaza and Hamas can never again be a threat to Israel, so that's that's why it's a necessary objective. In my view, is it can be sufficient if it's also connected to the mechanisms you create for what what comes afterwards. But on this issue, the question becomes: Okay, what do you do with the four battalions in Rafah? I believe there's less of a gap here than appears to be in public. The Israelis understand they're not. They're not going to go into Rafa when there's 1.3 million Palestinians that are crammed into the area. By the way, some of what we saw with Prime Minister Netanyahu was pure political posturing this week. You know, he, because we abstain uh, on the Security Council resolution, uh, he says he, he pulls back a delegation that was going to come here. Two points are worth noting. The first point is his defense minister was already here with his team. And guess what they discussed when he was here? Rafa. And they didn't just discuss 
an office order in the abstract, they talked about the different options for dealing with it. That's number one. Number two, Prime Minister Netanyahu said that he had to he had to show that he had to send a message to Hamas that Israel wasn't going to be pressured into not going into Rafah. He did it verbally, which I can tell you had no impression on them. If he wanted to have an impression on them, one of the things he would have to do is he'd have to start evacuating Palestinians who are there. Now, he has acknowledged that they can't go in while there's 1.3 million Palestinians there. So if you're not doing anything to evacuate the Palestinians that are there, you're doing nothing to prepare the ground to go in. If you say, you know, you're setting the date and you're doing this, that is not going to impress Hamas. What's going to impress Hamas is that they actually see, okay, they're actually preparing to begin to do this. Now, it is I where I agree with him is because this is sort of the last real sanctuary or the last real area where Hamas has not been, in a sense, none of their infrastructure has been attacked. They may think that they can hold out, and they have to know that they're not going to be able to hold out. That will increase the prospect of them, I think, looking to get a reprieve. And that's where this deal to release the hostages, at least buying 45 days, you're going to see an interest in a reprieve if the, if the noose is being tightened to the point where suddenly Hamas has an interest to get it to have a breathing space. Dan, Dennis, I wanted to ask you, last Sunday, former Prime Minister Olmert was with us, and he supported a ceasefire, and he said, essentially, Israel has achieved sufficient military victory at this point, and, and his view was that Israel should not go into Rafah, that, that the loss in terms of international condemnation, the loss of civilian Palestinian lives, it, that it would not be worth it and that that Israel has sufficiently knocked out the firepower of Hamas and reduced it so much as of a threat that it shouldn't do it. What do you think? Um, I honestly have mixed feelings because I do think it's, if Hamas retains these four battalions, it gives them a baseline to begin to reconstitute. Uh, I don't think they can retain these four battalions. Moreover, I, by the way, when it comes to Rafa, dealing with the four battalions is not the whole story. The whole story is making sure that material can't come in through that border, underground or on top. You know, when when you look at when you look at Gaza, and people would say that Gaza was an open air prison for Palestinians, it was not an open air prison for Hamas. They got whatever they needed. They built 400 miles of, of tunnels. They built this extensive military industrial base also underground. They had no problem getting material. So you, you do have to deal with that. Where I think he's right is Israel is paying a terrible price internationally. It has, for one, one factor that is, a, is responsible for this is they never released the videos of what Hamas took to all the networks, which they should have done a long time ago. Not at this point that it's gonna suddenly transform the image, but it's a reminder to people when they see this, how no one would expect that Israelis would live with that next door to them. So at least you begin to affect at least some of the imagery. They have to do a dramatically better job on humanitarian assistance. And that means not just ensuring that more goes in, but if if there isn't anyone else providing security of, dis, of distribution of humanitarian assistance, then the Israelis have to do it. They can't have it both ways. Uh, you can't create a vacuum and then do nothing about the vacuum. Uh, so dealing and changing the image of, of life and what's happening in Gaza is important for the Israelis from the standpoint of their own strategic objective. If they want to be able to go into Rafah, then they have to address the humanitarian side of that. The truth is, what, what Ehud Omer was raising, he's right if, look, if they go in and there's uh, you know a, a humanitarian debacle there. But that's the argument for why you have to do the evacuations. And by the way, an evacuation plan doesn't mean you simply evacuate them to Mwasi uh, or back to, to Gaza City. It means when they get to where they're being evacuated to, there is an ability to absorb them. There is shelter for them. There is food, water. Uh, there is medicine. Is that realistic for one in a third million people? Well, it's, first of all, Rafa may not be that big, but these these battalions are not all co-located. And you can 
there are areas of Rafa that you can evacuate. And where these battalions are, are not necessarily you know, throughout all of it. So you go after uh, wherever you've evacuated in certain areas, then that's where I think you go after those battalions. A lot of what is, you know, there's an expectation that Israel is going to go after Rafa the way it did Gaza City to begin with, not the way it's going to be. This but is I, going I to guess be I'm talking tailored. about the humanitarian side because you're talking about setting up places where refugees from Rafa could go within Gaza yes. and they'd have provisions and and they could be there for, for a longer term because undoubtedly the damage to Rafa would be severe, even if it's not the same as in right. northern Gaza. It's, there's still going to be significant infrastructure damage. Um, so is, is that realistic that you could coordinate the kind of international relief and in safe location for that large a population at multiple camps. But the reality is you can't do it overnight. It will take time. I mean, that's the simple reality is it will take time. And that's why one of the reasons I raised the issue, if you're serious about going to Rapa, the evacuation process should have already started. And it hasn't. So it raises questions about how serious is the is this discussion going into Rafa? I will say this: the entire war cabinet believes that you have to do Rafa. When I say that, so that means Benny Gantz believes it. It means Gadi Eisenkot believes it. It's not just Galant who believes it, and it's not just Bibi who believes it. So even people who are in the center believe you have to do this. But I think they also understand you can't do it in a way that compounds your problems. You know, you have to have a strategic mindset. You have to understand Israel has a set of strategic interests. It has a set of immediate needs to, to, be, to deal with Hamas and also to ensure it can't reconstitute itself. But it also has to deal with the way Israel is perceived internationally right now. And uh, the price that it has been paying is quite high. And it's not going to be simple to turn it around. Dennis, I wanted to ask you about uh, Politico reporting that the Biden administration is considering how to help fund a multinational force or a Palestinian peacekeeping team in post-war Gaza. Yeah. Not a surprise, of course, that that would be you know, under consideration. But you know, one of the catches that was cited uh, in the Politico article was other countries would say that, according to Politico, that they would want to see both Israel and um, Palestinian leaders, you know, be embracing of a two-state solution. And if if that's the barrier to that sort of peacekeeping force, um, it, given where the Israeli populace is and how Palestinians feel now, is them publicly embracing a two-state solution realistic? No, it's not. Uh, you, you, you put your finger on it. Right now, about 80% of the Israeli public are against the idea of a Palestinian state because they're convinced that it'll be dominated by Hamas. The polling that's just been done of the, of the Palestinians shows 71% favor what Hamas did on October 7th. Uh, and in a sense, they, they see Hamas as being a continuing political actor. So that just validates the Israeli view. We have two societies that are suffering from trauma. And the trauma means that they can feel only their own pain. There's an inability to take account of the other side's pain, to absorb the other side's pain, and to try to force them to focus on an objective that right now they both instinctively reject is a mistake. Now, having said that, do if you ask me, do I favor a two-state outcome? The answer is yes, because I know a one-state outcome is basically a prescription for a forever war. You have two national movements, two separate national identities competing for the same space. They will not coexist. Neither national identity is going to submerge itself and disappear. So two states ultimately, in my mind, is the only credible outcome. But you can't force it on two societies right now that can't absorb it. You have to think about a different approach. The approach has to start with fixing the realities on the ground creating a pathway for, as I said, a basic bargain of demilitarization for reconstruction, reforming the Palestinian authorities. So after it's been reformed in a year to 18 months, it reassumes responsibility 
uh, in Gaza. You need an interim period between now and then so that you can, you can manage Gaza with some mix of an international regional presence with local Palestinians, Palestinian business people, uh, functional people who have responsibility at a bureaucratic level. Uh, you, you create this as a kind of transitional process to then be able within a year or so, year 12 to 18 months, to have a reform PA come back in to be responsible for both the West Bank and Gaza. You can how would, talk how about- do you get by, How do you get buy-in though of Gazans to a PA-led government, even if it's a, a caretaker gov or, or, or point organization that's administered by an international peacekeeping force? How, how do you get buy-in? I think that the, the the notion that Palestinians, when this Palestinians in Gaza, when this is over, are going to want anything other than a respite, uh, you know, is it you don't? They are exhausted, and all they want is some small degree of normality. They're not looking for a forever war. They're not looking for ongoing conflict. They want to be able to begin to resume living. I'm not talking about a normal life just resume living. So the, the idea, when I say you raise the issue of buy-in and it's a very fair question, you start by having those who are helping them on the ground just begin to recover. And then you build credibility and authority by producing a process that begins to rebuild Gaza. The rebuilding of Gaza can also be employing Palestinians there. You know, this is a, the level of destruction there is hard to exaggerate. And so the level of rebuilding that's required, on the one hand, it's a monumental task. On the other hand, it also can provide an enormous amount of employment for people there who prior to this, the, the unemployment in Gaza was 50% before October 7th. Now the rebuild the infrastructure, the rebuild the housing, uh, you know, all this will, will produce a lot of employment. You have sore people with that. Uh, and and you also have to show the reason you have to have a reform PA is because Palestinian Authority has no credibility, no legitimacy. It has terrible governance. It's completely corrupt. Uh, and the people in Gaza understand that, too. By the way, they knew that Hamas was completely corrupt. They also understood that Hamas was basically focused only on the issue of resistance or, or fighting Israel, not on improving the lot of people there. There are signs, notwithstanding what the polling is showing right now, there are signs that when Hamas comes back into certain places, uh, they're being stoned by the people who live there. So my sense is that it is possible to create a process where Palestinians will be focused almost exclusively uh, on the reality of beginning is, to recover. Is, is, this, is this going to require, Dennis, a strong uh, reform PA leaders, someone who who has uh, respect of of Palestinians, or is this more of a of a technocratic sort of um, governed by committee, where it's not necessary to have a point person? It would help to have a point person. Uh, look, I think you start with a kind of technical, non political uh, structure that begins this process of rehabilitation, rebuilding, reconstruction. Within the West Bank, there is no credibility for the government. 92% of the population in the West Bank wants Mahmoud Abbas to leave. 80% thinks the, the Palestinian Authority is completely corrupt. Now, he has announced he's going to appoint Mohammed Mustafa as the prime minister. Anyone who is connected to the PA will have absolutely no credibility with the Palestinian public there. There needs to be the appointment of someone unconnected and untainted by the PA. We've seen it before. It was done in 2007 with Salam Fayyad. Now, at this point, uh, you know, the announcement of Mohammed Mustafa means you have someone who won't have real credibility. He is announcing we're going to have zero tolerance for corruption. Whatever he says, it'll only be believed if there are actions that somehow reflect that. 
and uh, you put me in the category of those who have to see it to believe it. I wanted to ask you about, and this is on the political side, also last Sunday, the former Prime Minister Olmert um, was, was very clear that he thought that um, Jewish and, and other Americans um, should protest the Netanyahu government. He said, to paraphrase, that Israelis pay significant attention to sentiment here in the United States and from American Jews, and that uh, even though it's in the midst of war in Gaza, that Americans should not at all be reluctant to be highly critical and call for an election in Israel. What do you think of that? You know, when Senator Schumer made his speech, and it's interesting, if you read the entire speech, it's quite a remarkable speech. There was a lot of pushback because he was calling for an election in Israel. And when I was asked about it, one of the things I said is if, if, if Chuck Schumer, who is such a fervent believer and supporter of Israel, is raising this, I think Israelis should think about how do we get to a situation where someone like Chuck Schumer could be calling for that? Now, do I think that that's going to produce the election in Israel? No, I don't. And I if, do I think that they, if Americans call for an election in Israel, that Israelis are going to hold an election? No, I don't. But I think the reality in Israel itself is pointing in a direction like that. Look, right now, the, the current government has a crisis, and it's not connected to the war. I mean, it is in a derivative sense, but it's the issue that the, the existing law that provided for the military draft in Israel and allowed the exclusion of, of the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox, so they could study in yeshiva, that law has lapsed. And the Supreme Court in Israel mandated that there had to be a law to replace it by April 1. And if it wasn't, there would no longer be a legal basis on which to continue to provide the exemptions for the Haredi students. And therefore, the Attorney General said there's no longer a basis on which to provide the money for the yeshiva. So there, the inability of this government to be able to produce a new legislation it has created a crisis. Now, maybe it'll be sorted out by, by the beginning of next week. But if it isn't, uh, that may bring the government down. Well, I mean, what's the sentiment in the country? I mean, is, is, is it your sense that there's rising disapproval of that exemption for ultra-Orthodox? And, and could we see after the lapse of this conscription for them begin? The answer to your question is absolutely. Because the burden is borne uh, in a disproportionate way by the secular. Now, there are religious people, but, but there aren't studying in the yeshiva who, who are uh, in the military. But there is a, there is a personnel shortage now. Uh, and, you know, there are, there are 66,000 uh, yeshiva students. Uh, and if you, if you, you could even use some of them, not necessarily for combat purposes, but to assume all these different support roles that are necessary, it would immediately address the personnel shortage. So there is, yes, there is deep frustration in the country over this. Uh, it's interesting that the, the religious, the leaders of the religious parties in the government had wanted the military draft to be the issue that needed to be addressed, not the issue of judicial reform. And the prime minister and his minister of justice, they made the decision, no, we'll deal with that later. And it's, you're, the heads of the religious parties are now complaining why did you deal with that instead of what is most important? It's not clear what's going to happen here. Some of the religious, some of the leaders of the religious parties are more mindful that if they don't find some kind of compromise in the longer run, the consequences for the religious parties is going to be uh, quite, uh, quite devastating. Well, and, and, and those on the right are, as you said earlier, Dennis, the ones who are uh, the most outspoken in their rhetoric about Israel prosecuting the war to the fullest extent possible. That's true. And so, if you need, if you, if if that's if that's your view of how the war should be conducted, then you need personnel for that. Uh, you need personnel for it. One of Israel has always had a small standing army. 
One of the consequences of this war is they know they have to significantly increase the size of their standing army. It means you're, you're going to have to serve longer when you go in initially. It means your reserve duty will be back to about 40 days a year, and it will go until you're in your mid to late 40s. This is a big deal for the whole country, and it means there will not be tolerance the same way there has been for uh, the religious parties not bearing a, a, some responsibility, some of the burden. As I said, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Doesn't mean you put them in combat units because, you know, logistic support for the military is a critical element of how a military operates. But if if the argument is they're exempt because they're doing religious studies and that benefits the country, would they be able to continue religious studies while doing that sort of support military work, the logistics? It's an interesting question. That's, that's the, the whole rationale, as I understood it. It is. No, it is. It's the study of Torah. And yeah. the study of Torah is critical, preserving the, the character and the essence of the state. So there has to be, no, no one is saying, even the people who say that there needs to be greater equity, no one is saying there shouldn't be any exemption. Well, what they are saying is maybe the age of the exemption needs to be changed. Uh, okay. Maybe they get exempt, you know, maybe you raise the age so that when you're 18, you go into the military and then you can you you study Torah later. Uh, let, maybe, me, let me bring uh, some viewer questions in, Dennis, sure. just because we're getting short on time. Many people want to know what you think the timeline for a potential election and a turnover of the government would be. And you you um, you briefly talked about this, but but what odds you would lay on the fact that it would be a, a non bb friendly coalition, which would come out the other end of an election? But I, it's let me start by pointing out something that I think creates a, a context for this. 70% of the Israeli government doesn't trust the prime minister, okay? 70%. So, you know, is there a, uh, is that enough to produce an election? No, because this is a parliamentary system uh, and this is a, go a government that has a majority of 64. And unless you have defections within that government, you can't bring it down. Now, there is a chance given what's going on right now on the military draft issue, that the religious parties could defect. Uh, that, that could bring down the government. Uh, will that happen now? I'm not sure. I still have a sense that somehow, probably there'll be some kind of compromise that buys another two to three months uh, where something is done. But sooner or later, this issue is likely to be something that does break the government. There is, by the way, a potential compromise uh, where in return for deferring, someone like Gantz, who was in the war cabinet, uh, and, and Gallant, the defense minister, has supported basically the positions that Gantz has on this. Now, I don't know if he agrees to what I'm, that he agrees to this point that I think Gantz is, is likely to propose. Gantz may say, we'll give you three months to sort out the compromise, but the only way we'll agree to the three months is if we agree to a, a date certain for the election. So that is what could bring down the government and okay. produce a new election. Now, there are other scenarios that I could that okay. can provide. Before the end of the year, you're going to have a resignation of the leaders of the military and the intelligence, and they will resign when, at a point when I think the, the basic military campaign is over. Even if, even if you haven't ended everything, but the basic military campaign is over, they will resign and assume responsibility for what happened on October 7th. But they're also likely to say, we bear our, the responsibility, we're resigning, but we were carrying out the prime minister and the government's policy. So we shouldn't be the only ones to resign. Okay. If the prime minister doesn't resign, you're likely to see a million people on the street and maybe the history group, the, 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 the basic labor federation, they call a general strike. That could produce uh, an election. Let, let me uh, bring another question. One of our viewers um, is a doctor who volunteered in Gaza, and, and the viewer said that um, they witnessed, that she witnessed firsthand starvation in the South as well as suffering in the North. And so I uh, would like some elaboration about the conflicting descriptions of what's happening with food aid. First of all, there have been periods, obviously, where food was not getting in. 
where there was a real problem. What I was saying now in the South, that doesn't seem to be the problem. I don't know when she was there, but I'm saying now in the South, that does not seem to be the problem. In the North, it remains a problem. Uh, Jeffrey uh, asks, um, how can one know what to believe? Media reports civilians being targeted without context, uh, no longer they're being mentioned of the hostages, nor the October 7th attacks, nor the kidnapping, abuse, raping, and beheading. Um, also have seen a Newsweek article that the IDF is actively avoiding non-combatant casualties more than any previous military but that doesn't get reported. So, you know, Jeff is asking about this, the, what we see in media. I do think what's happened is that the focus of the media has been almost exclusively on the death and destruction in Gaza, which is legitimate, and the suffering there. But they've tended to, in a sense, perpetuate an image and a story, and they're not covering a lot of the countervailing facts that suggest it's not all that way. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I think you see a kind of emphasis in the reporting that seems increasingly to focus only on Palestinian suffering and not on what the Israelis are trying to do to minimize it, what are they trying to do to minimize civilian casualties uh, and the like. And I'll give you a current example. The Israelis went back into Al Shifa Hospital in the North. Almost all the reporting that I've seen uh, in the Western press uh, has been exclusively about what the consequences are for that hospital, patients, and the like, with almost no reporting of the fact that Hamas actually went back to the point where the Israelis have arrested the leader of Islamic Jihad there. Uh, they've arrested around 450 Hamas members. They've killed about another 150 uh, who were there. They went back, Hamas went back, and turned this into a central command place uh, for, uh, for Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Now, the reporting focuses on, look at this consequence for the hospital about what the Israelis are doing, and not at all about, here is Hamas again, once again using hospitals, thinking that, again, they can use it, uh, and if the Israelis come after them, the price will be high for the Israelis. And this particular case, the Israelis appear to have waited until they were able to go back in and capture a large number of Hamas, including a lot of the Hamas commanders. Uh, Marsha asks or says, I don't understand why the world doesn't demand Hamas release all the hostages, dead and alive. It, it seems everyone points the finger at Israel and demands that it uh, withdraw and, and uh, hold to a ceasefire. But it's Hamas's action in not releasing the hostages that's at the center. So she wonders why is it only Israel is, is the one that gets the criticism and Hamas isn't called out? Well, I share that view. I, I, from the beginning of this, I have, I think there hasn't been enough attention put on the hostages. It should be, there should be a daily mantra. I would love to see religious leaders calling, not just for a ceasefire, but the immediate unconditional release of the hostages. I mean, you have hostages who are taken as young as nine months and as old as 85. Uh, it's unthinkable this was done. Why this wasn't the continuing mantra uh, of, of governments, of international institutions, of the Red Cross, um, that, that has bothered me. I have wanted something else from the beginning there should have been a constant mantra. Look, if, the, if Hamas wants to end the suffering of Palestinians, its leaders can leave Gaza. You want to bring it, you want to cease fire? Let the Hamas leadership leave. Erica asks, asks, why is the world not pressuring Egypt to open its borders for Gazan refugees, or at least for the bringing in of more aid to Gaza? It's the, part of the issue is this. There is a narrative in the, in the Arab world uh, that has a, a lot of potency, and that is that they are not going to allow Israel to solve the Palestinian problem by expelling Palestinians. And so there, there is this fear that somehow if you start allowing Palestinians in, it's not just that they may not leave from the Egyptian standpoint, it's that this is not the way the Palestinian issue is going to be solved. I do think that 
this was not an issue that the Israelis could have raised. It is an issue that we and others might have gone to the Egyptians early on and said, all right, look, let's, let's relieve some of the suffering. Be a firm, we'll, we'll, help, uh, we'll help defray the costs of absorbing people uh, in camps for a period of time. We will agree there's a date certain where they go back. Uh, that might have been something that could have been done. It could have been explained that way as a way of saying, this is about relieving suffering for the time being. This has nothing to do with how we're going to deal with resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But that wasn't done. Uh, and this and the imagery has taken on a kind of life of its own. I mean, it, it's a legitimate question because in everywhere in the world where there is a, a war, what do people do when they're in the middle of a war? They leave. They leave. You know, we leveled Mosul. We leveled Mosul. But if you were living in Mosul, you could leave. We killed a lot of civilians, not by design, but as a consequence. But a lot of people were able to leave. You look at Syria. You have a population that, that was about 24 million. You have 12 million people who either are internally displaced uh, or a good, a good 6 million left the country. What made this so awful for Palestinians is they couldn't leave. They were trapped in what is a small area and, and in an area where Hamas basically was embedded and exposed them. I wanted to ask you, just following up on her question about Egypt, we know, of course, Qatar is the center of the Doha talks, and they've been a major player here. Is, is Egypt involved back channel behind the scenes at all in, in um, trying to resolve this? Very heavily. I mean, they are as involved, if not more than Qatar. The reason Qatar is involved is because the political leadership of Hamas is in Qatar. But, it's, but Abbas Kamal, who's the head of intelligence in Egypt, he is the central player in this. And they're a central player because they have the ability, because they control Rafa, because they control access, they have the ability to, you know, to also apply pressure. Look, in the end, I suspect, you know, if, if we can create the right kind of humanitarian board mechanism that is international and regional, it has to have the Egyptians on it has to have the Gulf states on it. Egypt will play an important role on the ground. It can play an important role on the ground. Uh, the Emirates are prepared to be much more involved, do much more than we've ever seen before. I mean, all the time when I was negotiating, I always wanted to have the Arabs assume greater responsibility for and with the Palestinians, and no one was willing to do it. Partly at that time, because Yasser Arafat, if he was pressed by them, he was going to say, he was going to publicly announce the Arabs are trying to get us to betray our national cause. And he had the kind of stature uh, that basically intimidated the Arab states into not doing that. Now, Abu Mazen is not in the same position. And I'm seeing indications that we will see Arab states play a very different kind of okay. role. They want some kind of certainty about who can replace Hamas over time. Those who will go in there on the ground now don't want to stay there uh, any more in a sense than the Israelis want to stay there. So you have to have a process. And the reason that when I said earlier, you have to have a reforming PA, only a reformed PA can come in and assume a responsibility for governance and they can replace the Arabs who can be the bridge to the future. Uh, Dennis, let me just uh, ask real quickly, because I want to give you time for a closing statement, but Ruth and a number of other viewers have raised the issue that there haven't been video or photos of meaningful amounts of weapons found in Hamas tunnels by Israelis. And so Ruth and the other viewers want to know, well, to what extent have weapons been found? Oh, they have been found. They have been. I, I visited a base in Israel uh, that was literally laden. They were <laughs> kind of endless um, containers uh, of the weapons, um, and they're everything. I, I saw I saw mortars, I saw anti-tank weapons, I saw drones, I saw you know rocket launchers. Uh, 
why I aren't started. we seeing that video? Why, why? Because obviously there's a public relations side of this that Israel is is doing very poorly with internationally. Look, there's an information war which the Israelis have lost, uh, and um, I I can't explain. I mean, if you on a daily basis, if you pay attention to what the Israeli military is putting out, a lot of what they show is kind of compelling, but it gets it doesn't get a lot of exposure. It just doesn't get the kind of exposure. Look, it gets back to what we were discussing before. The focus is on the death and destruction, which is legitimate. It's completely legitimate to show that, but it's not the whole story. And it leaves everyone with an impression that this is the whole story. Uh, and unfortunately, there's another side to it that needs to be exposed and it just isn't being exposed the way it should be. Ambassador, a chance for you to make a final statement. And um, the late David Lehrer, who was at the center of creating this whole programs of America to Crossroads, um, so always like to leave us with something to look for as a positive potential in what we're dealing with and with so much death and destruction and risk involved here for all parties that may be tough to find here. But is, is there something that you latch on to that is hopeful? What is hopeful is, and I'm I'm straining a little bit, but what is hopeful is I do see a readiness on the part of Arab states to assume a bigger role and more responsibility than we've seen before. We have to, it is critical for them to and see that there is a reforming Palestinian authority because then they know they have a bridge to the future. It's, it's some of it's related to what you said before about some want to know that there's a political horizon with a Palestinian state and it's out there. I think there is a way to sort of reconcile that need because I think you can, you can talk about uh, the rights that, that Palestinians have to a state, but also the responsibilities that they have to be able to fulfill before they have that state. Yes, the Palestinians are a people and they have a right to have a state but they don't have a right to have a state that is led by Hamas or extremists. They don't have a right to have a state that is part of the axis uh, of resistance of the Iranians. They don't have a right to have a state that doesn't believe in coexistence. They don't have a right to have a state that doesn't build the institutions, so it won't be a failed state. So we should focus increasingly on the right the Palestinians have to have a state, but also the responsibilities that go with that. And by the way, when I say that, that doesn't mean the, Isra the Israelis don't have responsibilities. They do too. They cannot act in a way that makes it impossible to have a Palestinian state. And they have to, the extremist settlers who frequently are acting against Palestinians, uh, there has to be very serious systematic action taken against them. Ambassador, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Always appreciate your expertise and the many decades that you've spent at the center of these disputes and negotiations to try and resolve them. Thank you so much. Always good to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Please support these free programs, bringing you the highest profile, most informed guests you hear in any venue. You can make a tax-deductible contribution to keep this series funded with this level of guests at Jews United for Democracy. Dot org. That's JewsUnitedForDemocracy.org. Thank you for your support to keep this series coming. And as a journalist myself, I can't wait to hear the conversation next Wednesday at 5 Pacific with the former editor of the Washington Post, Marty Barron, who's written a terrific book about the stresses that journalism is under today. He'll be in conversation with a uh, gifted journalist herself, Pat Morrison, who you see regularly as a part of America at a Crossroads. That's next Wednesday at five o'clock Pacific, former Washington Post editor Marty Barron talking with the LA Times' Pat Morrison. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Good night.